morning, all. I am Christina Zaharia Hawatme, Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Language and Communication. And on behalf of the entire AUM community, it is my sincere honor to welcome His Royal Highness Al Hassan bin Talal to the American University of Madaba. Thank you. For some time, our students have been following and studying Your Royal Highness's extensive body of work. So today, it, today's event caps our year and offers a remarkable opportunity for our students to have a dialogue in the form of question and answers with Your Royal Highness, who is recognized as one of the foremost intellectual architects of our time whose work provides inspiring solutions to the most critical problems of our time. Today's forum will be opened with welcoming remarks by AUM Chairman uh, of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Victor Bidley, to be followed by remarks by our university's president, Professor Nabil Ayoub. The floor will then return back to Dr. Bidley, who will give us a vision of what plans lie ahead for AUM, and then we will have the centerpiece of our event will be the dialogue with, with our students. So again, thank you, Dr. Pillet. Your Royal Highness, Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and students. Our Prince needs no introduction. His Royal Highness, Prince Al Hassan bin Talal, has earned global recognition and status. This is not an introduction, but rather a tribute of trust, administration, uh, ad admiration, and respect. What I can say about a Prince who is accomplished beyond what one person's uh, memory can hold. A man who is brilliant among scientists and philosophers alike, a son of kings, and a descendant of the prophet. Yet, he connects with common people, feeling their pain and rolling up his sleeves. I can personally testify to that with many stories I share and continue to share with passion, enthusiasm, and appreciation. In my first travel with His Royal Highness to Spain in 1980, his, his normal day of work started at 6 a.m. and ended at midnight. His Royal Highness's efforts and dedication focus on illuminating human pain and injustices and elevating human rights, equality, and human dignity. Sahib al Sumu al Maliki al Amir al Arabi al Asil, we love you, we trust you, and owe you a great deal of gratitude. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Welcome to our university. Welcome to our university, a humble fruit of the many seeds of wisdom you planted in the heart of our nation. The concept of this university and its mission are a manifestation of the vision of His Majesty King Abdullah II. We are proud to be part of this fulfillment, of its fulfillment. Your Royal Highness, Prince Al Hassan bin Talal, Your Eminence, Your Excellences, distinguished guests, colleagues, and students. The month of May is a blessed month for the American University of Madaba. On the 9th of May 2009, His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI laid the cornerstone. On the 30th of May 2013, His Majesty King Abdullah II officially inaugurated the American University of Madaba. Today, the 24th of May, 
adds another memorable and bright day in the history of the American University of Madaba, as it is being honored by this gracious visit from your Royal Highness. Having opened its doors just six years ago, AUM is a young not-for-profit university dedicated to unearthing its students' potentialities, foregrounding their capabilities, and actualizing their talents. AUM is committed to providing its students with a comprehensive and well-rounded education, an education of which personal integrity is an essential and indispensable component. Through such education, AUM is also committed to empowering its students to become people of goodwill, ready to help others before self, dedicated to contributing to the advancement and well-being of Jordan, the region, and the world. Even within such a short period of its young life, AOM established 18 academic programs that are accredited by the Jordanian Higher Education Accreditation Commission. In addition, AOM is incorporated in the state of New Hampshire and is authorized by the New Hampshire Higher Education Commission to grant degrees for all 18 programs. As an American university, AOM is firmly on its way to international accreditation and to increasing the number of memoranda of understanding with U.S. and European universities. AUM is seeking accreditation from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, NIASC, Accreditation Commission. Such U.S. accreditation undoubtedly advance our efforts to establishing fruitful, viable relationships with other American and European universities for the purpose of drawing more exchange students, widening our endeavors to promote research, establishing joint academic programs and individual mobility. As for community engagement, AUM is in the process of starting a program to help foster for the innovative spirit of high school students. We will help high school students to develop their ideas into research-related projects of innovation. In addition, and as one of many examples, the Department of Pharmacy at AUM is conducting a weekly series of free medical support days open to the local community in Madaba in, collabor in collaboration with CERMIC Brotherhood, the Italian acronym for Servizio Missionario Giovanni. This is young missionary service, plus volunteers, physicians, and several pharmaceutical companies who donated pharmaceutical products as free medical samples. This initiative, which, donate, which we have called for peace and your health, comes as a joint project to gather forces, good intentions, and technical knowledge for the well-being of poor patients who are in need of optimal medical and pharmaceutical care. The service started on 16th January 2017, and only four months after its opening, the program has already served over 300 patients from among the local Jordanian population and Syrian refugees. Besides reaching out to the local community, this project gave the pharmacy students the opportunity of effective civic engagement to practice their study and to observe their positive impact in real life under the supervision of their tutors. Similar projects and training programs are now being executed and more will be launched in various specializations addressing the needs of the local community and reinforcing experiential learning. We again welcome your Royal Highness to the American University of Madaba, where we aspire to become a lighthouse radiating to the rest of the world 
out of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan under the wise leadership of His Majesty King Abdullah II. Thank you. I thought initially that we would give some kind of background to the global efforts that led to development of education and development of societies and institutions and countries as well through the global, uh, the United Nations system uh, with the World Bank and starting about uh, in 1990. The first movement for the development was the World Conference on Education for All, which was, uh, took place in Jom Tien in uh, Thailand. And Jordan was participating uh, by the Minister of Education at the time was Professor Hamdan, Dr. Muhammad Hamdan, and the uh, director of the president of NCHRD, which was established from Jordan under the uh, auspices of the Higher Council for Science and Technology where Jordan actually was one of six countries that were selected to submit their model national plans that were presented in the, at that conference. And every other region of the world, there were five others. The second role of, of uh, <clears throat> in 1992, uh, we have the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So that was about the same time after the education movement of education for all, then UNDP and the other world community started with that concept. In the year 2000, the development of the Millennium Sustainable, the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, uh, took place. In 2002, the World Education Forum, which is the global commitment to adopt the Dakar Senegal, that is for the world conference 10 years after Jom Tien, there was a further step in development and where they had put some targets and dates for achieving all these plans. In 2013, UNESCO World Conference, which was the sustainable uh, develop education for sustainable development. Now, we talk about the sustainable development goals. This idea gives you exactly what is at the global level in terms of communities, countries, and institutions, whatever. These goals were, the first one was poverty, second one, uh, zero, zero uh, hunger, and the third one is uh, good health and, uh, and well-being, and then quality education is number four, quality, uh, number five is energy, Gender equality. Excuse my eyes because I have a cataract in surgery. Number six is uh, clean water and sanitation. Number seven is uh, renewable energy. Number eight, uh, what is that? Economic growth and uh, development. And then number nine is the uh, innovations and infrastructure. Number 10, reduced inequalities. Number 11, uh, sustainable communities. And number 12, on the other side, that's three. Then we have 13, the, uh, the climate action and life under water for this. Number 15 is life on land, and number 16 is peace, justice, and, and strong institutions. And number 17 is the partnerships for achieving all these goals. So this is the overall arching theme uh, that was developed under education, higher and development at large. 
what AUM is attending, again, we selected 10 of these themes that are relevant to our institution and how our programs can fit into that, that vision. <clears throat> the first one is no poverty. This is the first goal. And the AUM's contribution is, first, we have not only Syrian but also other uh, uh, individuals who uh, need skilled labor. This university has uh, good workshops that can bring these on the days when the university is closed for students. We can turn this into functional use to produce skilled labor among Syrian refugees. And then they will have their own, they will not mixing with the other students because it's separate. Uh, the zero hunger comes when whatever they learn we have a plan which has already been approved and funded so far for the first phase of it to bring uh, hundreds of these people for within a year or two to produce materials. So we found donors who can give them raw materials after they get the skilled labor. So they begin to manufacture certain items and sell them. And we have five different skilled labor programs that have been developed at this university. And then the good health and well-being, on that we have the concept of AUM was to deal with the whole person, to deal with the mind, the body, and the health. So the unique program that we have at the undergraduate level is that every single student must take a course in physical fitness. We have a state-of-the-art physical facilities, about 5,000 square meter space for uh, physical fitness of all kinds, including squash, if CD wants to challenge a student with squash. <laughs> the physical fitness then is required. And then we have a series of courses called cultural development, again, which is required. So the first student will take one of each blocks. After that, he can specialize to become, if he wants, as a, an athlete where he competes and develops the skill at an advanced level. And again, the same thing for those who use the cultural line, they can develop uh, also in taking courses that makes them more professional. In quality education, the menu is quite large because the whole program in the university and all of its activities and connections with the local, with the regional, and also with the various businesses and uh, programs in, uh, in Jordan, we, uh, there will be new pr programs that we have uh, developed for phase two, and this is the, the market demand, uh, based on the market demands. And then we have the American education standards, which we sh should implement to be able to get the American accreditation from NIAS. By the way, the word NIAS entered into Jordan by the Amman Baccalaureate School, that was the first school in the region to be accredited by NIAS in, 90, in the mid-90s. Uh, and then the co-op education. That's a new idea which uh, CD uh, talked about uh, several years ago. We thought of alternating students between study and then go out to work and then come back to complete study and then come back for a program which they call in the US co-op education. It started in 1901. And there are several institutions based off this, and many, many success stories happen. So we hope to replicate this by allowing the student to serve at least three semesters before he graduates in the businesses or in the communities in a hospital or a factory or something, and then he comes back to complete his degree. We guarantee that those people will be totally employed immediately when they graduate. So that's... Uh, and six, clean water and sanitation. We have uh, recycled uh, uh, the wastewater recycling plant that produces clean water. This water is irrigated to, uh, to the various beds and flowers and trees. And by a smart system, automatically, it will distribute to each bed the type of uh, the amount of water that is needed uh, for it. This is already in the infrastructure, and part of it is functional. The rest of it will be done hopefully soon. Affordable and clean energy. AUM was the pioneer in the entire Middle East by establishing not 
sorry, the solar system, but the, the geothermal system which we will come to. But now we are in the midst of implementing the first phase of the solar system that will be uh, finished in July. Now, coupled with geothermal, and then we have <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the entire campus is going to be, uh, it's diesel free, we have no diesel on it, and therefore it's the first campus that will be truly called Green Campus, in addition to other features which are in the brochure that is uh, in your hands, so I'm not gonna go into that, those details. Now, the infrastructure has a building management system. Again, I don't think they have any large institution like uh, AUM that has this in full capacity. Uh, most of it is being implemented. There are a few items that will be added to it, and it will become like we have pedestrian campus. That's definitely the only one on campus where no cars can get in contact with students while they are throughout their study at the university from the day they arrive, the minute they arrive until they leave. Secondly, the wheelchair accessible, green campus, smart campus, radio frequency, ID access. This identifies students in certain zone, anywhere they go to for whatever reason that we have many, uh, of course, educational and uh, academic reasons to put this. The innovation idea that the president talks about is, is going to be one of the main pillars of the movement of this institution forward. We will have the concept of lab on wheels to go to the communities, innovation hall. We have creativity and innovation as a major theme. The AUM forums is also an idea of copying the Arab Thought Forum and other forums in the country, but we expanded the list to include the industry partnerships with a certain forum, the business leadership forum, ambassadors forum, UN forum, etc., etc. There were about nine or 10 of these fora that two or three might be happening at the same time, because one could be for the School of Engineering, another one for pharmacy, the third one can be for students, for the public. And in each one of these forums, what we are doing today, the students will be the ones who will talk to the businesses, we will prepare them a little bit ahead of time, give them ideas how to study about the guest who is coming, and then you can challenge him, as I hope they will do with CD to Hassan today. Industry partnerships, businesses, etc. So that's the key idea for the development of the, the whole development of the individual. These are all extracurricular activities. The sustainable cities and communities, we have uh, the wastewater management, the idea of a green campus. We had plans to actually to, to partner with the municipality of Madaba. And there were, there were visits and program was progress, progress to the level of having the, the, uh, um, uh, the mayor actually submitted an official proposal to the Minister of Rural Affairs that was in, I think, 2011, 2010. And the Italian company came to establish a, a recycling factory to take all the garbage from even Madaba, all the surrounding, even from Amman, they said bring it here. They established the municipality factory by the Italians, and then they will give a certain percent of the profit to, to the municipality for a certain year, and then they will turn the whole thing to the city of Madaba, and then it will become theirs, because it will be built on a piece of land that hopefully the municipality of Madaba will provide, and I think we will revive that project in the years to come, or in the, in the weeks to come. The responsible consumption and production, of course, Tarshid al-Istihlak and all that. We have the paperless campus, cloud. This is what we are working on it for the next plan, which is going to be implemented for the five-year strategic plan for the university. And uh, the cloud storage, we already talk about the clouds. No more hardware to be purchased but rather link with the cloud and have an account and use the minimum hardware that is needed uh, uh, on Earth. Digital workflow, these are some of the features. And the last one is partnerships for the goals. And here we have partnerships being established at the local level, regional level, and international level. And we have internships for student mobility, the idea of that, 
and study abroad. For example, at the local level, we will pick two institutions that are excellent. One of them will be Princess Sumaya, I hope. I hope they will uh, accept us to be partners. And then uh, another public university, and so that students, wherever they are, in the north or here or in Madaba, that if the student needs a semester to spend it here or there, the other university will acknowledge that. And this is the, uh, the Now, all this we are hoping to uh, um, see how it is going to happen. As you can see, the ideas, all of these, and the mix up of uh, everything else that is taking place, uh, we hope that uh, uh, all these cubicles will be put in a ball, and the ball will interact physically, chemically, and biologically to assimilate it into what we need to have as the sustainable university or the AUM graduate as a mark, landmark for what the graduate, what graduate we, we hope uh, to have. <laughs> These are the goals being achieved. They hit each other physically. They have good chemistry among uh, the different groups. And the final product will be an AUM as a sustainable university. And we have the AUM graduate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, uh, Sidi Hassan to the, the panel for our... for our discussion with the students that will be led by two students, Laura Al-Khatib and Amir Abbas. They will come forward and field questions from our audience. Thank you. So. The, the, for the mics to come. Your Royal Highness, we would like to start by thanking you for being here with us today and for giving the students of the American University of Madaba this opportunity. The students attending today are repre representatives of the various faculties and departments of this university. And for the past two weeks, we all have been learning more and reading about your intellectual and moral standings about certain topics. And I think it's very safe to say that we're all extremely excited to posit our questions. We shall. we shall set the format as follows. All of the students have been divided into four clusters. Uh, and each, one will, each student will be granted one minute to ask their questions. Uh, these questions have been architected in, in accordance to Sidi Hassan's priorities. And uh, kindly, after all these questions have asked it, we will ask your Royal Highness to add, reply to them in 10 minutes. 
Based on the format explained by Amir, we shall be starting with our first cluster, consisting of Tara, Tare, Sima, Sally, William, and Tala. Uh, will Tara Wuhyan please stand up? Good morning. My name is Tara Wuhyan. I'd like to first thank your Royal Highness for being here today and giving us this opportunity to discuss and have this discussion with you on your priorities and your works. While reading through your work, I was intrigued by a certain quote in one of your articles you wrote for The Telegraph, in which you offered solutions to deal with religious scriptures being used as a means or a tool for violence. The solutions you give us are seeing the scriptures within their context, uh, juxtaposing conflicting ideas, and an emphasis on interpretation. I would first like to start by saying that the theories and methodologies that you offer as a solution are built heavily on the works of Islamic liberatory theology. Scholars such as Fazl al-Rahman, Amina Wadud, Asman Berles, classic Islamic scholars who focused on justice such as the Mu'tazaliya. The theories that your Royal Highness mentions built heavily on these scholars' work towards achieve, achieving social justice and liberation in society. And these are things that resonate with me as a womanist Muslim in the region, which leads me to my question. Judging by the fact that these methodologies were built and constructed by oppressed minority groups, whether they are oppressed due to their racial and or gender realities, my question is, can you extract a methodology constructed by disenfranchised minority groups for social liberation and implement it to a general discussion on interfaith dialogue that does not acknowledge the power strictures and power imbalance that led to this methodology's creation? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Would Tara Saudi please stand up? Uh, good morning, Your Royal Highness. My name is Tara Saudi. I'm a business student from the Faculty of Business and Finance. I'd just like to thank you again for being here today. Uh, Your Royal Highness, you've written about the importance of uh, having more interfaith dialogue, especially today. But things seem so divisive today that how can we make people see past their differences and see what we have in common? And what role do you see intrafaith dialogue in having in this process? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Uh, will Sima and Sally, Sima Yassin and Sally Amus, please stand up? Good afternoon, Your, uh, your, your Royal Highness. Um, I would like to thank you for being here t t um, today. My name, is, my name is Sima Yassin, a medical laboratory student from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Your Royal Highness, my name is Sally Amos, a marketing student of the Business and Finance Faculty. It's an honor to be able to address you. Seema and I want to ask you about an issue that concerns many Jordanian women, which is the Jordanian nationality law. Basically, um, I come from a binational couple, and because my father is a Jordanian, I was granted the Jordanian nationality and all its benefits almost immediately. However, that was not the case with Seema. My parents are also binational, but in, but in my case, my, it is my mother that holds the Jordanian, the Jordanian nationality. For many years, she struggled and is still struggling with the fact that she is unable to pass on her, Jord, her Jordanian nationality to her children. Based on, bo based on both of our experiences, Based on both of our experiences, we would like to ask you two questions. First, uh, firstly, Your Highness, uh, your, your, your Royal Highness, uh, since, since you have this universal moral standpoint, we are interested to learn about your opinion of this, of this very important topic. And my question is, because I wish to ensure that my children can enjoy the privilege of a Jordanian nationality, what do you think we as Jordanian women should do about this social injustice? Thank you. Thank you, Seema Ansari. Uh, will William Farah please stand up? Hello, hello everyone. My name is William Emil Farah. 
I'm a second year civil engineering student. Good, good morning, Your Royal Highness, Prince Hassan. I would like to start off by thanking you for being here with us today at the American University of Maraba. Jordan has long been at the forefront of promoting tolerance and interfaith solidarity. But as the heated debate about the change in the curriculum and the murder of Nahid Hattar outside the courthouse reveal, there remains to be a gap within the Jordanian society about the role of religion in the public life. And public opinion seems to be drifting further away from the centrist stand that has characterized our society. Um, Your Royal Highness, here comes my question regarding this. As Jordanians, uh, where did we go wrong and how can we fix it? Thank you. Thank you, William. Will Tala please stand up, Tala Shalqawi? Uh, hello, my name is Tala Shalqawi. I'm a th uh, third year student studying risk management in the American University of Madaba. Your Royal Highness, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, earlier this year, you published an article in the Jordan Times about uh, human dignity being a key factor of security. In the reality of the Arab world, it is important to point out that a lot of females suffer from domestic violence. And the Jordanian law against uh, domestic violence states that women whose lives were endangered by their families are held, are held in prison as part of the administrative detention program for their protection. And their release is only conditional on the uh, consent of a male relative without a proper trial. My question to you, Your Royal Highness, is how is this law preserving human dignity and providing security within the community? Thank you. I, I must uh, throw myself on your mercy because quite honestly, the last question I didn't understand at all. I mean, I, I didn't hear it. I'm wearing hearing aids. And uh, I just want to say that I'm deeply apologetic for having been late for half an hour this morning. Probably, um, you have all heard of the Manchester bombing. Uh, quite um, um, honestly, the Royal Jordanian flight was delayed, and we arrived uh, just about 3 o'clock on Monday morning, partly because a suspicious object was taken off our aeroplane. Of course, this doesn't get into the press. You, you, seem, you seem to only get into the press if you're actually blown up. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, of course, um, our heart goes out to the um, uh, victims of the Manchester bombing. But anyway, my whole schedule was thrown off, and I'm very sorry today that there must have been something going on in town, uh, maybe an official visitor or something, and I was uh, delayed. So I'm finding it difficult to catch my tail this morning, quite honestly. But uh, Sharqawi, all I understood from your question was Sharqawi. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So would you please, and, and then may I just answer these first five questions before we get into yeah, another yeah. batch, because it's really, I think we're losing uh, thread. Thank you. Um, should I go? Okay. Uh, my name is Just Ta a little bit, uh, we'll take it one at a time, please. <laughs> I'm Sorry, an I'm, an, I'm an old man after my all. Bad. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Your Royal Highness, uh, earlier this year, you, pub uh, you published an article in Jordan Times about human dignity yes, I got uh, being a key factor of security. So in the reality of, Jordan, of the Arab world in general, it is important to point out that uh, females in general suffer from domestic violence. And the yes. Jordanian law against domestic violence states that women whose lives were endangered by their families are held in prison as part of the administrative detention program for their protection and their release is only conditional on the consent of a male relative. So my question to you, Your Royal Highness, how is this law preserving human dignity and providing security within the society and the community? Thank you. Thank you. Well, if I may just um, go quickly question by question, I assume, is what you would like to, to hear the answers on. And I start with Sharqawi by saying, as far as human dignity is concerned, I genuinely believe in human uh, uh, dignity. And I, go, I link that to the first question. Uh, you asked me, wherever the first questioner was, uh, about putting the text in the context. 
in terms of the methodology. I just want to say that methodology is, is a word which has certain connotations. Al-Uslubiya. Causality is a word that has a, a, a context yeah. also. As-Sababiya. I just want to say that putting the text in the context in Jordan is very difficult because this is a country that makes laws and this has been all my life, I have been asking this question and no one has given me an answer. Why is it that the asbab al-mujiba tatba' sudur al-qanun? Why is it that the justific justification in law succeed, not precede, but succeed the promulgation of the law? So you look at something and say, for example, domestic violence. Does the issue of domestic violence apply only uh, to cases of so-called crimes of honor, which I was the first Jordanian to, de to denounce as crimes of dishonor publicly and on television? As you know, in elections, I suppose we have local elections coming up now, the mayor will be approached by certain of the tribal leaders. The deputy, um, uh, the, uh, the deputy will approach somebody else among those uh, local leaders. Partisanship is very much a question of wusul, wusuliya, to the person, not to the issue. You don't go and establish a good relationship with the mayor because you want to discuss issues of domestic violence. You want to go, you go and establish good relations with the mayor because you want to discuss something that concerns you, the tribal leader, the member of parliament, the trade unionist. So the lobbying process is as confused as saying the justifications for legislation succeed the promulgation of the law. One of these uh, uh, sustainable development goals is zero hunger. I was asked by the World Food Program, Mr. Beasley of the World Food Program was visiting Jordan just a few days ago, and I was asked by his successor, his predecessor, could I, I would have kalimat ana, but I mean, I was asked, <coughs> Can we produce a zero hunger campaign for the region? So if you're talking about zero hunger campaign, you have to talk about interrelationships, linking issues, water, energy, the human environment, food, nutrition, etc. You want to talk about administrative detention, you have to talk about motherhood, because after all, these people in the so-called Jalwa, when one family is moved from one part of the country to another, are a mishmash of people who are in theory being protected under administrative detention. But in practice, as a result of the uh, Jalwa, they are a kashkul of mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmothers, who are moved into so-called administrative detention without anybody asking the police force in the first place, are you capable of protecting these people in the sense of protection, meaning education, health, not stunting their future growth as human beings? Today, if you have extremists who are involved with an extremist organization, according to the CVE, counter Violence extremism, CTE, counter-terrorist extremism programs, these extremists go into jail, they are educated or re-educated in theory, and then they come out and they stand on the pulpit, and young people, and in this I agree with them totally, are shocked by the fact that these people, who in a certain sense are hypocrites after all, because one minute you are promoting the death of the other, and the next minute you are coming to address the local community on how to behave as citizens. I mean, th there are certain dark spots in our causality, in our sababia. 
in our uh, uh, presentation of logic that have to be addressed. And this, I think, in the innocence of youth, should be addressed by your asking, how do you straighten a line? How do you look at the issue in terms of uh, cause and effect? Su'ila fa'ajab, al-mubtada' wal khabar Al-mubtada' amaliyan, the human dignity issue, somebody has been killed, right? This is what takes them to jail because of uh, a so-called <coughs> honor crime which is basically uh, part of our immaturity in terms of uh, relations as men and women. Somebody is killed. Even if they have gone all the way to Aqaba from Irbid and they are recognized in Irbid as having been uh, re relatives of uh, a particular family, they are killed in Irbid and yet the so-called tribal or customary law or customary notion of law means that uh, there has to be a sulha, a um, bringing together of these people, and ultimately it is the people who are on the peripheries of the crime, who have nothing to do with the crime, who are being taken to jail. Am I correct? Sorry? So I, I just want to say that you simply cannot live a modern and modernizing progressive state unless you can find an alternative, I'm not saying do away with the tribal legislation that is making everybody so uncomfortable and some people comfortable. A lot of people are making a lot of money out of everything. But at the same time, logically, isn't it about time that logically you understood what is going on? Logically, that those people responsible for tribal customary law, like Sheikh Mundar Haddadin, because he's a sheikh in the tribal sense, why, doesn't, why don't, don't you ask these people to sit down and explain to you what on earth is going on in this country? Otherwise, it's a push me, pull you. You're pulling towards progress and the application of law, and the pulling <laughs> and the pushing is being done, or vice versa, by these reactionary concepts of law that have nothing to do with human dignity. So I'm glad that you related the human dignity issue to this. But what I am trying to say is that human dignity is you have sustainability on the one side and development on the other. Human dignity should be the corollary. It's not triumphalist architecture or triumphalist buildings or high-rise buildings or uh, huge projects that are going to put the text in the context. You have to have, rather than projects, a vision. Is your vision social equity for all? Is your vis vision justice for all? Or is your vision to rush towards the 21st century while leaving all of these unnecessary issues unattended to. Today we learned that there is a new Chief Justice in Jordan. I don't know him personally, maybe that's a wonderful thing. But I think that is important to know is that is the new judiciary going to actually begin to address these issues alongside the Sharia courts, which are after all our family courts, alongside the canonical courts, alongside the tribal earth. These are issues that form a package that needs to be addressed with great detail. Regarding uh, a power that led to the creation of, uh, where was the first question? To the creation of uh, minority status you were talking about? You said to me a methodology that led to the creation of? Uh, yeah, the methodology that you offered as a solution, the looking at the text within the context, the scriptures, 
looking at these paradoxical themes within it and looking at these certain reinterpretations or interpretations, these are all methodologies that were created by scholars that seek social justice and liberation, but they acknowledge certain power strictures and the power imbalances that create these kinds of minority groups and communities. So they address these power imbalances. My question was if we can apply, if we can extract and apply this methodology on an interfaith dialogue, if we cannot, if we do not uh, address the power structures and the power imbalances that come with interfaith dialogue. Well, I would like to say that youth, uh, let's say under the age of, of, of 25, or if you will push it up to 30, created in the Club of Rome, when I had the privilege of presiding the Club of Rome, a group called TT30. The beauty about TT30, about all of you under the age of 30, is that you are unknowns in terms of political life, generally speaking. So you have not created a niche for yourselves which you have to defend in terms of, I am Ba'ati, I am communist, I am Islamist, I am... Uh, Qawmi, I am nationalist, I am mahsoob, or whatever it may be. So the people above this age represent to you and me, after all these years, I agree with you, that power is the elite, positional elite. Al-Nukhba, al-Mawqa'iyya, or al-Wadifiyya. Nobody knows you yet, whether you are extreme right, extreme left, center left, center right. But the talking heads are the political power. So if you would consider with me uh, a triangle, at the apex of this triangle is the political, uh, judicial, and executive. Somebody said, Ma'ali Shaab al Urdani. You know, this is the, the talking heads at the top of the, of, of the apex. The judicial, uh, as we discussed, is in a sense remote from social issues, the social issue that Sharqawi brought up, which is a good, a good point to be reminded about. The executive is getting on with projects and laws, and God knows, I mean, the executive has so much on its plate today. We were supposed to be two and a half million people in 91. Today, we are almost 11 million people. How is the executive going to manage all of this? No single country in the region can solve its problems on its own. And as for uh, the legislative, the parliamentarians, the question is still, are they looking at anapid al-tashri'ah in their interrelationship, education, health, and welfare as a basket, or are they looking at every individual issue separately? So they have their hands full with whatever they're doing. But I would suggest to you that as with the Helsinki Citizens Assembly, you know, Helsinki represents at least... Uh, 10 countries which saw transitional democracy, and in particular Hungary, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia, which are the countries called the Visegrad Four countries. I wonder why we can't talk about transitional democracy as a vision, whereby youth begin to contribute to the vision thing. And this is why I, I'm strongly recommending that maybe in the months and years ahead that we consider revisiting Mecca, Middle East Citizens Assembly, which we created in 2002, whereby I can address these issues knowing that at least there is a, an echo out there. But, I mean, if you try to engage in this conversation without a basis in fact, it is really quite, quite difficult to do. I mean, for example, if I may be a little bit mischievous, we were quite amazed that the uh, United States was offered such an enormously large sum of money by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia 
and somebody very kindly brought out the following facts. This was an international statement. ماذا يمكن أن تفعل بثلاثمائة وخمسين مليار دولار? Apart from anything else, it would close. It would attend to the budget of Saudi Arabia for six and a half years. This is to support the war on terror, the war against something. جعل أكثر من سبعين بالمئة من كهرباء السعودية نظيفة. القضاء على الجوع في العالم لأكثر من 11 عام. توفير مياه شرب نظيفة عالميا لثمان سنوات ونصف. الإنفاق على 137 دولة لسنة كاملة. So I want to ask myself when you put the question, how are you going to enable and empower youth, as I understand it, because it's enabling and empowering that section of the population which believes in change. Because all you're saying is basically, I cannot continue to accept administrative, de de administrative detainment without uh, proper life conditions without a hope for the future. I cannot e continue to accept that the t different groupings were empowered as a result of the legislation of the country, which at a certain time regarded as minorities, now they were, we're calling them mukawinat al mujtama rather than aqalliyat, a certain uh, uh, process of uh, exclusion. And one of you very kindly referred to exclusion in the third question, your bi bi bilateral question. You referred to the very important issue of binationality. I personally, I think I'm on, rec on record for many, many years as saying, please give Jordanians abroad full nationality, so that they can vote alongside with nationals of this country. Because I think that what is important about the couple of million Jordanians living abroad is that if they're going to vote on national issues, they're not going to vote on please provide a road to my private farm. Presumably they're going to vote on improving education, on Policies, not politics. So that is what I see coming out of this exercise. But whether uh, universally moral standards are being applied, no, I do not think that universally moral standards where they, where they exist are being applied. I don't think that those 137 countries all have moral standards which we could call universal. Maybe we are better and worse than some of them. But what is important for me is to recognize also the fact that with a carrying capacity that has increased from 2.5 million to uh, approaching 11 million people in 20 years, there's something extraordinary that's happened here. That we don't seem to recognize the importance of what could be called Arab citizenship for all those people who are studying in UNICEF Makani schools, for example. You have 300 Makani schools run by UNICEF, and God bless them all, they are teaching Palestinian, Jordanian, Syrian, Iraqi, without any reference to brand names. If you're talking about the carrying capacity of this country, then you are pro pro providing an Arab service. So why don't we consider Arab citizenship in whichever way it can be considered which is not something that you are granting, but the Arab world has to grant, as part of our Arab identity. I notice that in Iraq, in Iraq, we don't talk about Arabs anymore. We talk about Sunni, Kurd, and Shia. In Syria, you don't see an Arab population. Again, it goes down to the smaller identities. And I think that, it, that, that the only word that will possibly bring us all together is a shark or a mashriq.
عرب المشرق essentially are Palestinian, Jordanian, Syrian, Iraqi, Lebanese. And I think it is time that Arab al-Mashriq, who are at the top of the list of conflict uh, communities in the world, and if you go down to the south of the Mashriq, of course, where we find Yemen, where you have nine million people about to face starvation, and we have Yemenis coming to this country to be uh, treated in hospitals and so forth, I just want to say that Please don't look at the coffee. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> it's just my host being very nice. But I just want to say that in terms of Arab citizenship, for, uh, for, for your um, uh, a father passes citizenship to his wife and to his children, I think that if you are going to begin this khitab ijtima'i, we need a khitab ijtima'i. We need a social discourse, which is not necessarily to be taken as criticism in the bad sense, but to be taken as what you are being taught to do. Inductive, but also deductive reasoning. If you are going to be trained for deductive reasoning, then you have to be allowed to ask questions. It's your empowerment, which is what the Ministry of Education is trying to do, to link education with the market. I think you have to link education with the value system you want to create. Otherwise, why, why are you being trained in fora? Or why is dialogue being stressed in schools? unless you can actually exercise that dialogue, that right of dialogue. So you need to be empowered and enabled, and I would think that, quite honestly, if, if a father has been married to a wife and passes, then the wife has the right to the full responsibilities of a wife as she becomes a mater familias, if you will, the head of the, the, head of the family, and so on. But once again, I just think that the civil sector, you know, I said that triangle and that template of everything above. What about everything below? Civil society, universities, unions, associations, al-mujtama' al-madani should not be just another power group. Shabab al-Rabi' al-Arabi. But what about the information that we all agree on in such open meetings. I mean, this is more like a town hall debate than it is uh, a, a university session. We have to develop town hall debates. And New England, where you are hopefully being registered, is uh, very much the author of the town hall debate. As far as uh, interfaith dialogue and class differences, where was I asked about I, I, I think it, it's uh, in the politically correct world, it's very difficult to talk about class, isn't it? I mean, let's look at this, uh, uh, the man who uh, was, uh, is allegedly the man who blew himself up, the 22-year-old yesterday in Manchester. He was Libyan, born in England. Did anyone ask whether he was, what class? Why did he go to Manchester? When the first batch of students were going in the 50s and 60s, or even before that in the 40s and 30s, people came from Commonwealth countries as, the British, as in the British Commonwealth. I mean, we're not British Commonwealth, but my great uncle, Prince Zaid, went to Balliol, Balliol College, Oxford in 1922. My father went to John's College, Cambridge in 1926. I, a baby, went to Oxford in 1964. I don't think that being princes, you would call us working class. But on the other hand, <laughs> I, I, I would just like to say that the people who come over in droves recently are basically to fill specific requirements in the British working um, class context, I assume. I mean, that when they are taken by Canada, by New Zealand, by whatever, they are cherry-picked. 
to look at uh, whether they can work in the tech sector or whether they can work in uh, the garment sector or whatever. But not all of them are necessarily top achievers. Is there, a, is there something as a top achievers class? النُخْبَ الْوَظِيفِيَةِ The elite uh, profession. So I think that the issues of class, which are being debated coincidentally in that election process, which was suspended by the British while this uh, tragedy was mourned, is not an issue that is necessarily discussed in this part of the world. I think that there are more people with... Um, variety of backgrounds coming into office in this country than you would possibly accept if you actually put them under the microscope and discovered where they came from and who did what. I mean, you have a prime minister whose father was a farmer and a prime minister whose father was uh, the Mufti al-Malikiya to my great-grandfather. You have uh, people, you know, of, of different backgrounds who, who have come in, but I don't understand quite how you would like to equate the sustainable development goal behind me, which I see is equity and meritocracy, with your reference to class and interfaith. I don't think that the question of interfaith is uh, one which is opposed to meritocracy at all. I would have thought that your achievement, your ability to contribute, is what you should be doing. But if religion is just a, a tribal affiliation to your Christianity or your uh, Muslim uh, credentials or whatever it may be, then it may be interpreted as such. And then we get back to Wasta, of course. So don't forget good old Wasta. And uh, don't forget what we were discussing uh, earlier this um, uh, question of uh, arriving simply because you belong to an ideological tribe. I mean, in the case of the Ba'ath in Baghdad and, and Damascus, you arrived everywhere at the top um, echelons because it was a one-party system. We're in a country where it's not a one-party system. I, I, I wish that effectively we would develop a party system where there is a a conversation whereby you understand what it is that you are trying to do in terms of empowering for responsibility. And at the question of responsibility, by the way, it, Gibbon, the famous historian, was once asked about Athens. He said when the Athenians wanted everything, a better life, better human conditions, and so forth, they got it all, but when they wanted most freedom, from responsibility, Athens is to be free. So I, I regard you, even though I've been half an hour late, even though we've um, had our ups and downs with the microphones, even though the occasional uh, uh, whatever uh, battle with nerves in trying to get the message over clearly, I would like to say that I believe in you. I mean, they say, are you optimistic? I believe in youth. That's why I am optimistic. But don't let the system wrong step you, wrong foot you. Find a way of asking the necessary questions at the right time and gradually building this snowball effect between yourselves and other peers that you have in other universities and so forth. And let us see formal dialogue being instated. I mean, if the Oxford Union can do it for whatever it's worth and have its uh, standing whereby heads of state and I don't know, come and speak to the youth, why can't you be effectively the interlocutors of those who really want to know what's happening? I'll stop there because I think there are other questions. Thank you, Your Highness. Oh, sorry, you asked me about the murder, forgive me, the murder of Nahid Hattar. What did we do wrong and how can we fix it? I, I would think that in building the hatred industry, which is so common to our part of the world, that's where we went wrong. And all of us contributed to building the hatred industry, including al marhum Nahid Hattar. I mean, he wasn't exactly... Uh, 
restrained in expressing his views. And he had the extraordinary misfortune of meeting this man who returned from Hajj and thought that it was his duty returning from Hajj to carry out this uh, murder, this act which nobody approves of. Nobody approves of murder. But on the other hand, of course, it became an issue and we condoled the hatters and we, you know, you can always continue to put oil on troubled waters, but when you say how can we fix it, I think to fix it is to make public debate more acceptable, more respectable, and this is what, what I think Nahad Hattar, in the sense, gave his life for. Thank you, Your Highness. Mm. Uh, we'll prepare next series of questions. Uh, Abdullah, Tala, Anas, Farah, Yasmin, and Rami. Uh, will Abdullah, Rafi, please stand up? I got Abdullah and Yasmin, but forgive me, I won't remember the others. <laughs> uh, good morning, Your Highness. Uh, my name is Abdullah Rafi, and uh, it's an honor to meet you here today. Um, if I may, I, I want to ask you two, two questions. Uh, with regards to the recent U.S. missile attack on a Syrian airbase, it seems there is a lack of sound strategy or any end game for the Syrian conflict. Um, for my first question, what kind of intervention and foreign policies should Western countries undertake that can be productive for the future of Syria? And for my second question... Please, hold, please hold the mic a little bit away from oh, your chin. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and for my second question... No, the uh, first question, please. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for my first question, okay, uh, what kind of intervention and foreign policies should Western countries undertake that can be productive for the future of Syria? And for my second question, uh, President Trump has been proposing the establishment of safe zones in Syria. Do you think safe zones are a viable option to tackle the refugee crisis, or will it only bring the U.S. closer to a confrontation with Russia, uh, taking into consideration that they may establish uh, uh, no-fly zones? Thank you. Please repeat again. <laughs> Um, President Trump has been proposing the establishment of safe zones in Syria. Do you think safe zones are a viable option to tackle the refugee crisis, or will it only bring the U.S. closer to a confrontation with Russia, taking into consideration a no-fly zone may need to be established? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Will Tala Arabiat please stand up? Hello, Your Highness. My name is um, Tala Arabiyat, and I study English language and literature in the Department of Languages and Communication. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming here today, and thank you for all the contributions you've made to the intellectual, intellectual world. My question is in regards to Sharia law. Sharia law is perceived by some as a misleading source of guidance that undermines democracy and can be marginalizing and non-inclusive of other religions. However, in your article for The Guardian in 2014 regarding Mariam Ibrahim, you outlined ways in which Sharia law can be a form of protection and benefit for people who it governs. Throughout the Arab region, examples of Sharia law being um, implemented in positive and successful ways is, can be found. However, there are nations that implement Sharia law too literally and as an unquestionable guide. How... What steps do you think leaders in the Wana region can take to use Sharia law as an advantageous w in an advantageous way, and how can these leaders and us as citizens improve its perception? Thank you, Tara. Uh, will Anas Tabarini please stand up? Uh, Your Royal Highness, Prince Hassan, firstly, I would like to thank you for giving us the honor of being here with you. My name is Anas Al-Tabarani. I'm a third-year banking and finance student in the uh, Faculty of Business and Administration. Uh, the, West, uh, the West Asia and North Africa Institute mentions, and I quote, many countries in Western Asia North and North Africa suffer from weak rule of law and institutional accountability. Thus, such legal exclusion has proven negative economic growth, uh, livelihood, social equity, and stability. Um, furthermore, the article also states that the theory of change is that by giving people power through skills, information, and tools, they will be able to protect and uphold their rights, access services equally, 
and demand accountability. My question is, Your Highness, how will this information, skills, and uh, tools be transmitted, and how can we narrow down, if not eliminate, the gap between skills and knowledge? Thank you. Thank you, um, Anas. Will Farah Shaban please stand up? Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is Farah Shaban. I'm a third year student in the Department of English Literature. Your Highness, to deal with poverty as a challenge and fight it, there are two methods. The first one is the reform of laws and modification that would help in empowering the ones on the periphery and the minorities. The second one is knowledge building to come up with paradigms to eradicate poverty and empower the agency of those on the periphery. In the status quo in this part of the world, there is a deficit in law and knowledge that causes a huge gap between these people and the resources and services. I would like to hear your perspective on this as a member of the Commission of the Empowerment of the Poor. Thank you, Farah. Uh, Yasmin Hassan. Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. My name is Yasmin Hassan, and I'm a second year banking and finance student. It is such an honor to have this opportunity. My question is concerning the equal employment opportunity of women in Jordan. Our constitution ensures women an equal opportunity when applying for jobs. However, in reality, some women experience prejudices against their use or lack of use of the hijab. My question is, what can we do to ensure that women own the opportunity without jeopardizing the freedom of appearance? Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. On may to I our last again, question, of course. May I ask you again, please, just to give me the question? The last, last part. Um, what can we do to ensure that women own the opportunity without jeopardizing their, um, their appearance, the freedom of appearance? Freedom from the appearance. Okay. Mm. Uh, Raymond, I'd, may you I'd ask? like to, uh, if I, sorry, this is the last question in this batch? Yeah. Um, last question. Please, by Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. My name is Remy Nimri. Uh, I am a fourth year student uh, in the Department of Literature. My question is as follows. In your visit to the Pope in September of 2014, you created an advocacy document in which you asked that the nations of the world undertake coordinated action to promote a sense of shared humanitarianism through five fronts. The fourth front states, and I quote, it is essential to illustrate to our youth that they can develop a sense of well-being and fraternity through communities of faith. Else we run the risk of our youth adopting extremist positions as they look to develop a sense of meaning of life, brotherhood, and belonging. My question is, Your Royal Highness, what measures have been or are being taken in order to instill this sense of well-being in the youth of Jordan? Thank you. I would like to... Uh start again with the sixth question and to say that the uh, Holy See, the Vatican as a state, has been extremely supportive over many years in trying to develop a conversation over a new international humanitarian order. That is to say from 1981 to 1988 when the commission of that name proposed in 1988 to the General Assembly, the adoption of an international humanitarian order, the uh, call by the Vatican for an ethic of human solidarity has been extremely uh, supportive of this continuing appeal. In 2013, the Security Council, for the first time in its history, held a special session on water Never before had the Security Council discussed an international policy issue. We've had politics and conflicting politics, but the uh, concept of the water peace nexus is vital because there are no two countries in the world who have solved their water problems that are going to go to war. And I want to say that in terms of my... Um, being privileged to call on Pope Francis on more than one occasion. I think that the 
feeling I came away with was that the conflicts that we are facing to get today, whether man's uh, confrontation with man, modern wars and their consequences, the question of belonging to which you referred, refugees, is a major issue because unfortunately refugees are looked at in different brand names or silos, as you know by the definition of the refugee organizations, international organization of migrants. Uh, refugees are described by uh, national background, Palestinian refugees, for example, UNRWA, the High Commission for Refugees, the uh, uh, displaced persons, the internally displaced persons. Nobody is looking, as the Holy See does, as at a critical mass of humanity. And in, in November of this year, there is a, an appeal once again Incidentally, the water summit will be held in Brasilia in March of next year. I was very happy to hold the high-level conference uh, here in Jordan on uh, the issue of international water management, but it would not have been possible without the uh, special attention given by the Holy See on two occasions. One, a meeting held in the past few weeks entitled Aqua Vitae, Water for Life, where I don't know if you saw the TED Talks relating to that meeting. For once, the whole issue of ethics and water, the, ma the matter of life, the stuff of life, water, was discussed in a context which uh, was uh, spiritual, uh, aesthetic, clean water, quality of water, spiritual in terms of respect for life, respect for uh, water as a humanitarian um, uh, priority. So I would like to uh, point out that in November we are hoping to revive the call for a humanitarian order. And I'm just wondering in this world where everyone talks about the need for order, the need for world order, the need for regional order, the need for national order, how can we reinstate that order without focusing on humanitarianism as a principle. So in that, I'm um, just stating my life's journey has been enriched by my conversations with the Vatican. The question before, once again, uh, sorry, garbled in translation or transmission, but you spoke of constitution, terrorism, and freedom. These are three words I picked up. And once again, I think that our problem uh, relating to the first question is that we are always working against something. Why are we not aware of the fact that we are not going to change the world around us, that out of 42 conflicts in the world, 41 are sadly in Muslim-majority countries? And that's not only because we are so unpleasant. So unpleasant but it's also because of the fact that we are placed on strategic waterways, oil and gas. I refer to this region as the black, the hydrocarbons, and the green, the fertile crescent. So in a sense, you have the hydrocarbons and the carbohydrates. So isn't it about time that we started talking about intra-independence? I respect your identity, you respect my identity, but at the same time we work on developing creative commons, regional commons that we share. And I link your question to the first question, that one of the re legal com commentaries on this region is that even in the Gulf Cooperation Council, in 22 regional border disputes, uh, most of them have not been attended to yet. So our border is all basically defined by what we have inherited from our colonial past or by the um, uh, regional uh, priority of attending to oil and gas and waterways and so forth. The result of all of this is that 80% of the world's refugees are Muslims. 
So I would link the question, if I may, to an earlier question on the subject of zakat and international work. One of you referred to zakat in terms of the West Asia North Africa Forum. I think the young lady over there. You mentioned Wana. So I would just like to suggest to you that Wana has produced an excellent paper on zakat, which you may have seen, I don't know. But Wana as a think tank cannot be the arbiter on the subject of zakat as far as the Muslim world is concerned. What is my problem with zakat? What is our problem with inter in, 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 between what I would call Twitterverse and universe? The problem is you're, you're talking about a universal zakat fund. You're talking about an accountable fund. And if you do this, basically you're talking about defining who Ibn Sabil are. And Ibn Sabil, as in the zakat definition, are the refugees of all uh, legal definitions of today. So, yes, we will continue, but I just want to say, why is it that there is this reticence in the Muslim world to come forward and to implement a legitimate institutional initiative, which is zakat, which would be empowering and enabling to people across the world, because zakat is not Muslim-centric, it's everyone who deserves zakat should be empowered and enabled with zakat funding. And I think the reason for that is that, uh, as I implied earlier, it's cheaper to make war than it is to make peace. So, I mean, where is the money going? It's going into the military-industrial complex. And this was what President Eisenhower warned about in his famous speech in 1959. As far as empowering for literacy, uh, and you mentioned a board, is it, is it the, the young lady over there? Has she left? I don't know. There's a young lady in black who stood up a minute ago. Oh, there you are. So sort of half in black, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, you mentioned empowering for literacy. Well, once again, in Ta'lim al Kibar, adult literacy and the eradication of adult uh, literacy. I think probably is getting less attention today from the Ministry of Education, where's the Undersecretary of Education, no, then, the huh? was invited here. But the Undersecretary is here somewhere, isn't he? Yeah. Because, of course, the Ministry of Education is overstretched in terms of its responsibilities. But once again, to link your question with the other question of um, uh, info knowledge, one of you put the question of info knowledge, I would like to invite you to consider the following. Social media, which has become very popular by the end of the last decade, has billions of active users today. At this moment, more than 1.9 billion people use Facebook. And these billions of transceiver humans, if you will, in certain countries are actually being educated using this facility. In Bangladesh, for example, the basics of uh, market, uh, garden to market agriculture are taught through women, through uh, mobiles. And I just want to ask you, whether it is not possible, if we're going to talk about informed humanity, whether we're going to talk about literacy for life, whether new inventions and technologies in the field of Internet of Things, IoT, and you mentioned cloud computing, big data, data science, engineering, whether we can't get around the basic fact that can you provide a better quality of education by educating with ideas rather than simply with data, knowledge rather than simply with informatics. So that's as far as I would go. And um, if there are any other points, forgive my bad the hearing. I didn't account for. Next group.
You mentioned negative economic growth, but once again, are we talking about sectors of the economy or are we talking about negative economic growth of Jordan with this additional population bomb? And once again, I think that you know the whole issue of the new industrial zones in uh, finding jobs for refugees and nationals is uh, the way to go. But if we continue without taking uh, crucial decisions, such as when does our endemic uh, conversations about correcting the education system actually end with a few practical decisions? Meaning, I'll get jealous. Thank you, Your Royal Highness, for your valuable input. Now we would like to move on to our third cluster, which is composed of Yasmin, Suhail, and Aisha. Will Yasmin Snowball please get up? Are you all Jordanians who are asking the questions? Or? I, think so. I think we have nationals of other countries in the hall, don't we? There's a lady with the red turban there who just put her hand up. Hello, Sidi Hassan. Thank you for allocating time for you to be here with us today. My name is Yasmin Tariq Snowball, and I study pharmacy in the Faculty of Health Sciences. My question to you is about education. To start with, Your Highness have spoken extensively on the topic of social justice and its role for sustaining peace in the region. But the reality facing Jordanians today is one of injustice and huge disparities not only in wealth, but also an opportunity. Jordan has long been a pioneer of education in the region, but we have largely lost our step. The quality of education has deteriorated, and the gap between the haves and have-nots cannot be clearer than it is in education. Comparing the education that a pupil would receive, for example, in West Amman, is a world apart from what his counterpart would receive elsewhere placing them at a disadvantage that is extremely hard to overcome. What steps do you believe Jordan should take to remedy this situation? And what is our role as students? Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Will Suhail please stand up? Um, good afternoon, uh, Your Royal Highness. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I'm reiterating what my colleagues have already said, but I'm so, uh, in any case, I'm Suhail Yassin. I'm a fourth year student in business administration. Um, Your Royal Highness interfered in the case of a young Sudanese Christian woman born to a Muslim father and Christian mother. The penal law in Sudan said and continues to say that religious conversion is punished with death. This is relevant to my question. In the face of increasing extremism and intolerance, what steps can be taken to protect freedom of religion? Thank you, Suhail. Will Aisha please get up? Um, good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. It's such an honor to have you here. My name is Aisha Kabir Yahya. I'm from Nigeria. Um, I'm a third year student, faculty of languages and communication. Speaking of the future as an inventor in water conservation with multiple projects, the future must seem pretty blink to you. As we all know that water shortage has been a major problem around the world. Um, my experience in African countries such as um, Kenya, Tanzania, Morocco, it has been a critical problem to them. Your Highness, my question is, what keeps you hopeful that we can get this water problem under control? Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. The floor is yours, Your Royal Highness. Can you please repeat the last, the last part of your question? Foundation schools, you said? Foundation school, mm. no, I didn't mention. 
I said my question is what keeps you hopeful that we can get this water problem under control? That was my question. Control. Control. Hmm? How can you get this, this issue controlled? The water. Mm -hmm. May I just, anyway, go on. May I answer directly? I, did, I just wanted to say it's a very good question and it's very timely. In terms of um, uh, great river valleys, from the Mekong to the Senegal, we have observed the importance of transboundary water management. In the case of the Bodensee in the Lake of Constance, I want to tell you that we had Swiss, Austrian, and German nationals started a program in 1954 whereby 300 towns, the people of 300 towns, own the water. So they own the purity of the water, they own the management of the water in every possible aspect. I wonder whether this uh, region would not benefit from a Jordan Rift Valley program whereby the emphasis is on social equity on both sides of the river. I, my impression is that Israel has too many cards in its hand today. Desalination, which it can afford with the new discovery of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. 23,000 kilometers of gas in the Eastern Mediterranean include Israel, Syria, Turkey, Cyprus, Egypt, the Lebanon, of course. And in terms of Lebanon, I just want to announce that a new international water bank has recently been proposed and supported uh, to the tune of up till now $5 billion, the purpose of which is to take the water, as in the Zambezi, for example, as in the Senegal, any water that is actually being wasted to participate in its desalination if necessary, but also of pumping water back into their natural aquifers. I can, can't believe that in Jordan we still can't pump water back into the Azraq natural aquifer. After all, after the creation of this famous uh, Khirba Samra uh, plant, the purpose had been that the water would be pumped back. When we look at water management in Jordan, archaeologically, we're talking about seven or 8,000 years of uh, lava desert where the water used to flow from, uh, and still does, from Jabal al Druz, Jabal al Arab, into Jordan. And I think that practical examples of what was achieved in the past, such as rebuilding a dam, which is 8,000 years old, is one way to capture the imagination of the population who can then see that through better management, we can actually control, as you said, uh, the variables of what is happening. So uh, I, I would like to uh, draw your attention on the website to Blue Peace, the foundation of that name, uh, to the Water Summit, the preparation for in Brasilia, and I mentioned the Security Council meeting, the first of its kind ever, on uh, water, and also to the International Water Bank. So thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. We will be moving on to our next cluster, consisting of Faris, Yola, Noor, and Amir. The, and it's the last cluster. Um, so can Yola please stand up? As far as the... Sorry. You have the last question. No, I mean, last cluster. There are a few. And cluster of students. Okay, carry on. Then maybe I can ask you a few questions. Hello, Sahla, Your Royal Highness. My name is Yalla Khouria, and I'm a third year student studying risk management. My question is equality is an important principle of humanity. People with the same qualifications should be treated equally, regardless of their gender, religion, or social background. Up until now, we still experience the effect of WASTA in our daily lives. Your Royal Highness, as an advocate of meritocracy, what is your opinion? 
And from your vast experience, can you comment if such phenomena will ever disappear or will it stay part of our culture? Thank you, Yola. Uh, Faris Fakhouri. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. My name is Faris Fakhouri. I'm a senior. Uh, I'm a graduating senior of business administration. As a Jordanian who descends from a big tribal background of Christian faith, and though not a believer in tribal or, or faith distinction, where would I be standing as a young Jordanian, the country's evolving identity? Thank you, Paris. Can you tell me what your real problem is? <laughs> Where do you stand as far as your real identity? I mean, I, I, I hear the words, but what is your real problem? I, 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 do not my, see my, I do not see myself in the future of Jordan as, as, as opposed to what my grandpa or my dad saw himself. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Faris. Can Lien Khatouni please stand up? Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. My name is Lien Khatouni, and I'm a third year English literature student. I would first like to thank you for dedicating some of your time to be here with us today. It is truly an honor. My question to Your Royal Highness is concerning Jordanian-Israeli relations. In an article published in the Jerusalem Post in 2014, Your Royal Highness stated that Israel must acknowledge its own role as a stakeholder in regional stability and development by committing to peace along the lines laid down in UN Security Council resolutions. Furthermore, Jordan, along with its neighbors, must be included in talks and negotiations pertaining to the peace of our region. However, in light of constant violations of UN international laws on the Israeli part, do you still see peace negotiations as effective? And is dialogue still a possibility since the conflict is submerged in, in imbalances of power relations? Thank you. Um, Noor Snowbar, can you please stand up? Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness. My name is Noor Snowbar. I study language and literature in the Faculty of Languages and Communication. Um, an article by the Jordan Times featured the launch of the Adyan Dictionary, in which Your Highness highlighted its importance to offer insight into different religions. What is your moral standing on that being taught in schools as opposed to only one belief system? Thank you. The, the last part of the question was, what is? Uh, yeah, what is your moral standing on, that, on the Adyan Dictionary being taught in schools as opposed to only one belief system? Thank you, Noor. Your Royal Highness, the floor is yours. Uh, may, I, may I say that in terms of the um, um, your, Christian curriculum and the Muslim curriculum issue, if I understood you correctly, as early as 1968, I remember with uh, Al-Mutran Ni'ma Sam'an, God rest his soul, the question was raised, why are Christians not taught Christian, Christianity in Muslim schools and why are Muslims not taught Christianity in Christian schools or in, as part of the national curriculum. I am still pondering the same question. I'm not evading the issue. All I'm trying to say is that my impression is, and I, I would like your um, uh, advice, my impression is, uh, your eminence, that, that the um, Christian uh, curriculum has only been adapted, that is to say, as you know, you have 14 different uh, confessions of the uh, Eastern churches, has only been adapted in Lebanon. And my question has always been, not as a escape answer, isn't it time that we developed how should I put it? You know, in the Bible, you have an analytical concordance of the Bible. So you, within the Bible, you have, 
if you understand what I mean by analytical concordance, you know what something means in book, in, in book this and book that, if I may. Now, isn't it time that we developed an analytical concordance of values? The only person I know in this world who is working on this subject from the Sorbonne is Professor Barbara Cassin at the Sorbonne University, where you have an analytical dictionary. Because it seems very clear to me that matters of faith cannot be discussed. I mean, I went to a public school, a mission school in the United Kingdom. I did not go to the chapel, nor did the Jew, nor did the Roman Catholic, because it was an Anglo-Saxon, uh, I mean, forgive me, Church of England mission school. So we studied our own books. So the question is, are we talking about shared devotions? No, we're not, because I mean, basically uh, in Assisi, for example, you mentioned Pope Francis, I've always been approached by people who say, why are we here? Is this syncretism? Syncretism means that we all have one dini ilahi, which is just simply not the case, because each one wants to believe in their own uh, tradition with their own text. But can we develop a shared value system? I think this is possible. And if Lebanon can do it, why can we not do it? But as far as um, canonical issues relating to justice, my information, such as it is, is that when my grandfather first came to this country in 1921-22, uh, the uh, Christian community basically accepted, because it was still, imagine Jordan in 1922. You mentioned your father and your grandfather. I mean, life was very different. There was no talk of institutional arrangements and legislation. There wasn't even an assembly apart from a a constituent assembly. but So they accepted, basically, that the law of the land um, uh, is developed. But nobody has actually stood up in terms of Christianity in the Arab world and said, look, religions do not enter into dialogue. Because I believe in my text and you believe in your, for those who are believing. But what we can have a dialogue over is values. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, I basically want to go back to the, the uh, golden rule. And one of my you know, uh, responsibilities over many years was to serve as moderator of the World Conference for Religions and Peace. So we had nine faith groups. Believe me, I had a sheet of the different versions of the golden rule with different words do unto others as you would they do unto you. And this is repeated in every faith tradition. So this is the basis of the equi equity that we're talking about. This is the basis of the um, mutual respect that we are yearning for. This is the basis of the protection that we still have to build. Because I will stand by you because you are a citizen and it is my obligation to stand by you because if I don't stand by you, uh, you know, I don't know if you know the story of Pastor Neumüller in uh, Germany before the war. There was a pastor, uh, Neumüller, and uh, he's, he basically pointed out that they came for the communist and I didn't care. They came for the socialist and I didn't care. They came for the whatever, you know, this, this denomination. And I, by the time they came for me, there was nobody left to care. You know, so if you don't have this uh, social responsibility instilled in you early by a clear definition of values, then why are we talking about the battle of right and wrong? Who is right and who is wrong? One man's terrorist is the other man's freedom fighter. You know, all this business of finding loopholes is born of the fact that there is little clarity. And so I, I thank you, and once again I am exhort you and others to continue to make the point that maybe you would consider a shared uh, value approach. And I would be very happy to attend or participate or whatever it is 
in any meeting you would wish to further this conversation because it's, it's taken uh, certainly 45 years, 50 years of my life. I mean, when we first started Your Eminence with Cardinal Pinedoli all those years ago, we were pro-non-Christianis in the view of the Vatican. Non-Christian. Okay. Today, we are los otros, the other. So every other denomination in the world is los otros. My concern is that the basis of all our fears are binary pathology. El thunaiya. You and I. Am I afraid of you or do I respect you? Do I regard you as a potential partner intellectually and morally or do I regard you as a potential enemy? And this is where the enemies of stability, the promoters of anarchy, work best. So please bear in mind binary pathology. I mean, if your teacher stands in front of you and you really have no respect for him, then you have a, a negative binary, binary pathology. You have mu'anat and you want to learn the subject matter, but you also have the mu'anat of really feeling that that particular person is not necessarily qualified to speak, which is why I'm saying that you can, you know, take people and clean their image and say they've been, you know, reintroduced into society and they're better people, but maybe they should choose another field than coming back to, to speak morality, having a background which is recognized in law as having violated that morality. As far as uh, Israel, as you know, Security Council resolutions do not apply to Israel. And whatever is said about Israel as being a prominent, I mean, I noticed yesterday Mr. Trump said, I have arrived in Israel having visited the Middle East. And the Israeli minister was sitting on the side, put his hand like this. And then he, you know, he tried to make a virtue out of necessity and he sort of, you know. <laughs> So, I mean, what is this? Is Israel a part of the Middle East or is it not a part of the Middle East? I mean, the catastrophe of, catastrophe of 1967 changed our lives catastrophically. How can I put it that way? They even object when we talk about the Nakba, and how can the Palestinians and the Arabs talk about a Nakba? Well, it was a Nakba to all their lives. It's a catastrophe. So they take the text out of the context and say, how can you talk the, about the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 as a catastrophe? On the other hand, I want to point out very clearly that in terms of the settlement process, I have always used the word musta'marat, not mustawtanat, colonies, not settlements. Because you can settle in your own country. But when you are colonizing other peoples and reducing them, I mean, we, we say we have a status problem in our country, but we are an independent free country. But on the other hand, what about those poor people who are building those colonies with Palestinian labor, Palestinian building materials on Palestinian land, and they do not have a right to be recognized as citizens? And yet they call themselves the only democracy in the region. So what applies to them just simply doesn't apply to others because they have such a mastery of spinning that uh, they present an, an alternative uh, image. And I have been wondering whether it isn't time that this country developed <coughs> an understanding of how to promote an interrelated idiom which can say to the world, and in particular the Friends of Israel in the, in, in the world, that look, for example, 
You mentioned resolutions and legitimacy is contained in that reference. 100 years ago, what did we have? We had the Balfour Declaration, which made very clear that nothing that is suggested in the, the British government commitment to the, the Jewish national home, nothing should in any way endanger the rights or be prejudicial to the rights of the indigenous inhabitants, the Palestinians. Now, put the text in the context. This is what universities should be doing. Let us look at the last hundred years and see what went wrong from the different points of view. Analytical concordance. What went wrong was that in 1918, it was the end of the First World War, which was actually a European war, in which the United States participated, of course, as it did in the Second War. So this fiction came up of the West and the rest. Some of the rest are more privileged than, <laughs> than others, and Israel has become a, an expression of Western uh, reality on the ground. But in fact, if you look at Israel, it is pluralist as much as we are pluralist, in the sense that you have Ashkenazi, Western Jewish, you have Sephardi, or um, uh, Spanish of Spanish origin, you have um, uh, Oriental of different origins in the Orient, and you have, of course, uh, the Palestinian Arabs. So my question basically is how can we start a lecture series, and when will we start the lecture series, that says to the world, come 1918, 2018, and we're starting next year in Cambridge University, just to give you a, a hint, how can we bring scholars of the different backgrounds to say to the world, look, we want to have scholarly closure, here is our point of view. You talk about Iran as the main enemy today. Is this a diversion from the major issue? You talk about Israel in terms of the implementation of democratic principles. Is this not to be questioned? You talk about the Palestinians and their rights but at the same time, you exclude their right to speak about the elephant in the room, which is the settlement process. More screaming, more shouting, more heartache, more blood only serves the downside. There are those who believe that war should continue until Armageddon, who want to speed up the end of days, so they think. But I think more clarity and more responsible uh, commitment to expressing a case may be, just may be, the way to go in developing, as I said, the clear understanding of the Levant. If you look at this Levant, as I said, the Arab Levant, the Turkish Levant, the Iranian Levant, and Israel are actually the most intellectually endowed part of this so-called Middle East region. What is the rest of the Middle East? The Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf, where you have material interest. But in terms of a population that is uh, possibly going to be a bridge between Europe and Asia, especially if this silk route that they are talking about from China ever develops, silk route, a maritime silk route and terrestrial silk route, it is this part of the world. So I would agree with you entirely that one of the big problems that have existed today is the absence of clarity in terms of Security Council resolutions. But I also want to say to our Palestinian friends that they have monopolized what I would call Palestinian-Israeli particularity for so long that we have not even been able to discuss the issues that need to be rediscussed in the context of our bilateral peace treaty. Our water agreements need to be rediscussed and reopened. 
I mean, I made a, a small list of these things that are still outstanding if you're interested in uh, listening to them. Jordan is interested in water, agriculture, tourism, cultural heritage, industry, logistics, communications, joint airports, energy, construction, and finance issues. All of these issues are important to Jordan. But we have kept all of these issues in abeyance until Palestinian-Israeli conversations engage on substance. But if it's just a question of going back to 1967 lines, that is an enormous undertaking. And I want to say that when the Jordanian-Palestinian team came together, I had the opportunity of addressing them time again because I had the opportunity of writing a book on Palestinian self-determination, maybe the first of its kind in the early 1970s. Khalid al-Hassan of the PLO said to me, can we publish it as a PLO document? I said, no, I didn't ask the Jordanian government to publish it as a Jordanian document. It's my thinking on the subject. Taqrir al-Masir al-Shaab al palestini was basically what my great-grandfather, Hussein ibn Ali, was exiled for. He, he died and, 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 and was buried in Jerusalem simply because he, would, he said no to drilling for oil until the right of the Arabs is recognized. So my question at that time was, if these territories were occupied from Jordan, which was sovereign in, in, for 17 years, I'm not talking about the so-called Watan Badil. I'm just saying that if Jordan has to be responsible toward the Palestinians, then Jordan is the outer, uh, outer perimeter signatory to an agreement. Israel would have to sign with the Palestinians to create the two-state system, and the term Benelux, you might have heard of it, has been repeated time and time and time again. I recognize your identity, you recognize my identity within the context of intra-independence. Not interdependence, not crumbs from your table, but intra-independence. But we're never going to come to that if uh, somehow visits like the ones that we have uh, uh, seen to the region, red carpet uh, uh, receptions and so forth, are not going to address the issues. I mean, when the um, dust has settled in the, in, in the next few weeks, maybe we will understand what really happened. But I was always interested in playing with words. Hamas aksu samih. Fat aksu hatf. The opposite of fat is death. Hatf. The opposite of Hamas is samih. Forgiveness. And suddenly, out of the blue, Hamas develops a a new statement of its uh, definition of uh, the Hamas Charter in which it can say, well, I have actually left the negotiating responsibilities to the others, but if they fail, then don't blame me. And suddenly we are all surprised to find that Hamas is also on the international terrorist list. So, good old Muddle East, never a dull moment. As for the question of identity and dads and granddads, you know, I was talking to Mr. Sykes of Sykes-Picot, not the one who was alive in 1918, I, that's a bit before my time, <laughs> but a son or a grandson. And he said, you know, my father was much maligned, or maybe his grandfather, I don't know. I said to him, you think you have a problem? What about my grandfather? Wasn't he much maligned? <laughs> so. I, I just want to point out that your question of the question of your identity, I think in a sense there has been such a leap between our fathers and ourselves, if I can even put it in the context of my father, who would be in the age of your grandfather, presumably. Everything has been turned on its head in Jordan. The young don't really unless you are a, an exception in the case, I don't know the question came from you, 
The, do you really understand the hardships that your grandfather faced? Well, this is the point. I don't want you to live in the past, but I do want you to accept that there has been a quantum leap from Ta'lim al Bayd al Rif to sitting in this air conditioned hall. You know, it, it, it's something I can't put in words in five minutes or maybe five days. You'd have to travel with me all around Jordan and to sit with people. I won't forget Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense of the United States, coming with me to Masab al Mujib. I don't know if you've been to Masab al Mujib, probably on your way to Aqaba. You know, you go from Amman. Huh? McNamara, we have another. Are you a McNamara of the same family? Yes, sir. No. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense in Vietnam, became a born-again peacemaker by his words, not mine. I'm not being sarcastic or whatever. He genuinely was a good man, at least the man I knew and had the privilege of working with. And he said... You have to dignify that man. And he was pointing at the men who were taking tomatoes on donkeys from Masab al Mujib to Diban. Four hours, five hours in the hot sun. Don't sell the land to hotels until you have assured yourself of the rights of these people. Vested interest in this country has been stronger than public interest. My question to you and to all of you, do you know what the word choreography means? Give me one person who will answer me what is choreography. Not choreography, but choreography. C-H-O-R-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. Well, I'll answer you. <laughs> Red shirt over there. Choreography? Maroon shirt, sorry. Did you raise your hand? Well, stand up and tell us what is choreography. You know, I want to tell you what choreography is first. Choreography is between topography and geography. So if you want to talk of Shu Mustaqbal al Shamal, you have to look at all the variants, the maps. Habaibi Jordan still has three different ways of making maps. So if you are Joe citizen, and you want to go out there and stake your claim, which of these three maps applies? And it's a lot of difference. How long are we going to have a reckless disregard for facts and figures? So I would suggest that maybe many things have been said about the development of the Jordan Rift Valley and the Jordan Valley and the Jordan context, but at least it was one package. I don't know when we're going to look at the north and the center and the south as one package with clear priorities. I mean, if you want to build schools, you have to look at the logical basin where you can build a school or build a university. You can't build a university on the top of every hill because I want one. When we bought in the national grid, I remember people saying, why is this uh, ministry, Wazart al Taqa, creating an awareness program? Merkaz Ta'rif al Muatin fi Taqa. I said, because it burns, it kills. If you go too close to the pylon, it'll kill you. You go to, too close to the water pipe and shoot at it, you can uh, get some water. But why don't we create a national water company where everybody has a share, where the poor will not be allowed to, uh, to sell his share so that the rich doesn't, the haves and have-nots, control the share of the, of, of the poor. Where well, we have a national stake in water management. Unfortunately, this concept of 
جمع ما بين المكاني والإنساني between what is regional and location and what is human which produced you mentioned the word Hima Dr. Victor Berle mentioned Hima earlier Hima يا حامل Hima is an Arab term Aramaic term that has now entered the International Union of Conservation of Nature lexicon وين الحما في الشمال الواحد في الوسط في الجنوب إذا إحنا ما قمنا بواجبنا if we did not develop our responsibilities towards this region towards its integrity where is our integrity if we don't think in terms of integrity that is our uh, problem you say equality and wasta how can we eliminate wasta unless we recognize that wasta is in direct contradiction to the public good الصالح العام القاعدة الفقهية you talk about sharia if you want some fiqh القاعدة الفقهية is very clear المصلحة غاية الحكم the public interest of all of us somebody once said to me يحكم عليك التاريخ قلت يا اخوي ليش يحكم علي انا لوحدي ما يحكم علينا كلنا in terms of uh, the Sudanese uh, Christian and what measures can be taken to uh, protect if you're asking me to look into the case per se I use the case as an example but I was talking about freedom of religion in the region as a whole as for example we have the rise of ISIS and the subjugation of virtually anything that's not Salafist, but in particular, for example, Shia Muslims and Christians in ISIS-controlled regions. I couldn't agree with you more. That's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, the other day I was asked by an American, he had the Sunni and Shia, and in an American accent he said, Sunni, as opposed to Sunni. <laughs> so he said, are you a Sunni Muslim? I said, no, I'm a very cloudy Muslim. <laughs> I think it is tragic, tragic, tragic that they go on about Iran, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. Neither of these two countries, neither does Iran represent all of the Shia in the world because there are so many Arab Shia in Iraq, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in Oman, in Yemen, in India, and so forth. And certainly Saudi Arabia does not represent all of the Sunnah in the world. You know, I was talking to a Swiss lady some years ago, and she said to me, look, I'm very embarrassed to ask you, but are you really an Arab Muslim? I said to her, yes, madam, but why are you so embarrassed? She said, because you're normal. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, look, I mean, assuming 100 million of us have just completely left the, you know, we're absolutely crazy. Doesn't that leave a few of the one and a half billion who might be a little bit normal? So I think that citizenship has to be attended to, but remember that every war in the world created institutions. You mentioned Bretton Woods and the United Nations. This region has no institutions worth the name. The Economic and Social Commission for West Asia is, after all, a United Nations organization so it reports directly to the United Nations it does not necessarily report the authentic views of the people of the region it's not there for that we do not have an economic and social council that meets every day of every quarter at the level of civil society economic and political leadership and then presents a report as a region this is why I'm talking about the Levant as a region because you can't talk about the consequences of the war in Syria without talking about refugees. We have 1.4 of 4.3 million people in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey. So we have to talk about human beings as human beings, about carrying capacity. The Arab League is a traditional organization that basically organizes once a year or looks to Arab countries to organize their Arab summit. 
But in reality, the organizations of the league are not doing the kind of professional work that organizations are doing in Southeast Asia. Why can we not take Southeast Asia as an example? Two million Khmer Rouge were killed, uh, forgive me, two million Cambodians, Cambodians were killed by the Khmer Rouge in, in four years. However many people have been killed in our part of the world, they have not come to that figure, thank God. However, the Southeast Asian nations cooperation has held together. They have accepted Cambodia's membership. They have accepted Burma's membership. They have monarchies. They have republics. They have different entities. Why are we so different? Is it because we are not allowed to come together? Is it because the black of the oil is separated from the green of the Fertile Crescent? And if that is the case, why can't at least the green of the Fertile Crescent be allowed to develop a common language? After all, we celebrate Arab Renaissance. What was the Renaissance about? Nahdat al-Arab al-Ula started before the First World War, Fikriyan, using Arabs, Muslim and Christian, and many, many Christians who were the authors of this concept of unity. Why can't we go back to that spirit? We always go back to the triumphalist side of our lives. But it's the spirit of Renaissance, which is basically gave the right to the Greek people after the Ottoman state uh, declined and disappeared. The Albanian people, the Armenian people, whomsoever, they created their own national identity. Isn't it about time that the Arabs created their own national identity? So I'm maybe straying from your point, but I don't think I am when I say that we need to revisit the concept of muatanat al-Arab lil-Arab. Kull al-Arab. So I, I agree with you entirely. In al-Qasim al-Mushtarak, al-Salih al-Am, regional commons, public interest is the way to go. But how to get down to the grassroots between the haves and the have-nots and West Amman and all the rest, I heard you very clearly, I think, saying West Amman. Uh, I still know the streets in East Amman very well, but I can't get around there at bar. I go there occasionally to have an ice cream because they have the best ice cream in town. But apart from that, <laughs> so I, I don't know how to answer you other than repeating everything that has been said all morning, equity, respect for the other, human dignity, uh, a recognition that security is not just about weapons of mass destruction, and not just about fighting against something. But can you help us create this citizens' assembly? Can you help us create a, a, a cultural initiative whereby we talk about culture in terms of the youth charter that the Arab Thought Forum worked very hard on with thousands of youth from all over the Arab world, emphasizing what brings us together rather than what separates us. Thank you so much for listening. Well, I, I just wanted to, uh, the encouragement of Dr. Victor to ask you one or two questions. First of all, you wanted to ask a question. Maroon shirt and no color. Um, hello, Your Royal Highness. I appreciate your visit and your patience. My name is Burhan Shahruri. I'm a pharmacy student, fourth year. My question is regarding your vision in youth investment. Considering them an important element of Jordan's resources, what are the actions required from us as students and as educational institution towards the development of this vision? Development of what? Okay, um, I'll be straightforward. What is required from me as a young adult towards um, um, the investment in uh, youth vision? Well, I, I don't know, but I mean, I've, I've tried to repeat during the whole of this. Um, uh, do you know the word cephology? Unfortunately, no. 
Does anyone in this room know the word psephology? P-S-E-P-H-O-L-O-G-Y. Psephology. Not only knowing the, fa the figures, I mean, I can know sitting in Amman, presumably, how many students there are in this university and how many are studying what, and I assume you're one of them. However, do I know you personally? Do I know, or does the education authority know what you are, what your qualities are, what your background, what your aspirations are? A cephology in Israel, they have, believe it or not, a chief cephologist. Because after all, Israel is the size of Silicon Valley. And they want to know exactly who is where and what, and, and, and doing what. India, huge India, have cephologists so that they know who are the people in this billion people who are coming to the top in terms of meritocracy. So they know what their qualifications are. Britain, Canada is the world's uh, human resource development expert in terms of Queen's University and York University. So what are your responsibilities? Have you assessed yourself recently? What do you think your forte is? What do you think you can contribute as a citizen after graduating? Well, uh, doing something for my country. Yes, okay, but I mean, what, what can you offer? Okay, I, this panel is your country. Well, I May I ask you, Muhammad, what do you want to do for your country? Well, um, um, according to my major, which is pharmacy, I'll try to do something related to helping people buy medications. Well, by real estate, did you say? Well, yeah. Medications. 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 And education. Medi medication. I oh, medication. medication. What medication. sort of medication no, are you no, qualified for? No, um, I think that there are lots of diseases that they need medications. So but what? I'll, I mean, are you into general health? Are you into preventive health? Are you into, I mean, you know. Um, I think I will do whatever I can. I, I don't know what Well, I, I think I am, with all exactly. due respect, that is wonderful, but at the same time, it's not enough. So I, th I don't think it's fair to me or fair to you, because I'm sure you have many more specific ideas when you've sat down, and tomorrow you'll be saying, well, why didn't I ask him this and ask him that? But I, 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 I think that it's about time that um, you recognize that nobody is owed a free meal. And if you want to do uh, medicine and you are not going to become a doctor, maybe you would like to consider that nursing practitioners, for example, in this, in, in this time, are far more important than doctors in many ways. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't know whether in terms of self-assessment there is an, enough thought given in universities today to this uh, aspect of it. In fact, I was going to ask you a question. I was going to ask you, do you have any role models? And please don't tell me the Prophet Muhammad, or Jesus Christ, or uh, your mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any role models? Tomorrow is Independence Day. I understand His Majesty King Abdullah will be honoring you role models of youth, what do you think a role model in Jordan is? And don't tell me me either, because that's passé. <laughs> Any thoughts? Um, should Anyone? I answer? Who is a Jordanian role model you'd like to follow? Anyone. A Nigerian role model. <laughs> Thank you for coming, first of all, Your, your Highness. Uh, my name is Ammar Abu Raghib, and I think my role model would be myself in 20 years. Probably that would be... Uh, so it's work in progress, your yes, role model. Yes, exactly. Okay. President. Our president. Oh, Our president. president your president Nigerian in Nigeria. President. I thought yeah. the president of your university. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, well, explain to us, for those of us who don't know much about President Buhari, what, uh, how do President you... uh, is Muhammad Buhari, Bukhari, General sorry. Muhammad Buhari, yeah, he's our president. So he's really working hard for our country. Um, and he's really fighting hard for the Boko Haram, I think so. Do you, do you happen to know anything about uh, Dr. Hawa Ibrahim from Nigeria, who is now a Harvard professor in, in law, who yeah. assisted in getting people who are condemned um, to uh, capital punishment, women, no, for, I really know. I'm sorry. Uh, out, out of jail? You know, this is the kind of thing that I want continuously asked. I mean, for example, when the Arab astronauts uh, came down, there was an ast American astronaut and the Russian cosmonaut. One was uh, Saudi and the other was Syrian. And I said to them, please, why don't you travel around schools and explain in simple terms what got you there? I mean, that never happened. Mohammed Zuel, for example, the Nobel uh, laureate in Femto, which is faster than nano, as you know. Uh, yes, he did a little bit of that. But again, I ask, where are the role models? Who would you aspire to? But thank you very much. His basic training was law. Uh, Dr. Bukhari, uh, for example, President Bukhari, his, was he basically a law professor? or what, what was his basic training? Why do you regard him as a law model from a, an academic formation? <laughs> Can someone volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> What is this, West Nigeria or South Nigeria? <laughs> he is a military man. He's Harold Model, so I cannot I really explain. But he's, he was a former military president of Nigeria. I see. But he is working really hard for the country to, number one, to fight corruption. When he came in, we had extreme terrorism. He found a way to control it, and now it's under control. So, yes, he is a role model to most Nigerians, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I want to thank you all very much in conclusion, and once again, let us regard this uh, beginning of a process, if possible, and I promise not to be late. I'll be half an hour early next time. <laughs> and uh, not just an event. So all the very best to all of you in everything that you do and you wish for. And thank you very much for coming from Jerusalem. We're being invited for, uh, to a group photo, I understand, so I don't know where that's taking place.